Well, today I want to speak about mothers. Mothers, if you're in the house, if you're watching, this message is about you, but if you're not a mother, just grab on and go with her because the Word of God is, is for all of us, but specifically I want to focus on the power of a mother's prayer, the power of a mother's prayer. I'm going to talk about six things today. Get ready. The first is families, you and your household. Secondly, set apart children. Third, the widow and the unjust judge. Fourth, Hannah, mother of a priest and a prophet. Fifth, the Gentile mother. And last, the mother of James and John. But first, families, you and your household. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to focus on this. When God called Abram, who became Abraham, God changed his name. The promise he gave to Abraham, listen to it. It's in Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. Him who honors you, I will curse. And to you and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Can I tell you that God speaks and thinks in families? He's not really thinking about individuals. He's thinking about families. And he told Abraham, I will bless every family through you. God speaks and thinks through families. Check this out. In the book of Acts, if you'll remember, there was a Gentile, an Italian, Cornelius. He was a centurion. And he honored God. He feared God, but he wasn't a Jewish man. He wasn't in the covenant. So he really didn't know the Lord, but he honored him. He prayed to him, and he offered sacrifices. He gave to the poor. And one day, an angel of the Lord came to him. His name was Cornelius. He's an Italian. I love the Italians. He came to an Italian. He said, Cornelius, go sin for a man named Peter. Go sin for Peter. So Cornelius sent for Peter. If you know the story, Peter had a vision. Peter went to Cornelius. Peter was kind of shocked because it was a room full of Gentiles and Jews were not supposed to mix with Gentiles. But he had this vision that said, don't call common what God has blessed, what God has made holy. And, and so Peter went to the Cornelius' house and Cornelius said, bowed at his feet. And Peter picked him up and said, I'm, I'm a normal man like you. Well, why did you send for me? And he said, an angel appeared to me. An angel appeared to me and said, send for you. But there's more. Cornelius told him what the angel told Cornelius. Listen to what the words of the angel in verse 13 of Acts 11. And he, Cornelius, told us, this is Peter talking, how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa, bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. Listen to this. The angel from God told Cornelius that if this man will tell you how to be saved. Peter will tell you how to be saved, but not just you, Cornelius. This is not a word just for you. It's a word for your family. All your household will be saved with this message. From heaven, all your household. But there's more. Do you remember Paul and Silas were in prison in Philippi? They had gotten beaten up because they delivered a woman who had been trafficked. She had been trafficked because she was demon oppressed or, or possessed. Paul delivered her from that demon, she couldn't tell the future anymore. And so they, the guys who were trafficking her beat Paul and Silas up and put them in prison. And you know the story. In the middle of the night, they were worshiping God. Earthquake happened. Chains fell off. The jailer, who was his job was to keep the prison secure, said, oh, no, all the doors are open. They're all going to escape. They're going to kill me. Might as well kill myself. And Paul said, don't kill yourself. Don't harm yourself. He knew by the Holy Spirit, apparently. It's dark in there, y'all. He said, don't hurt yourself. We're still here. The jailer came in with a light and said, sir, what must I do to be saved? 
The power of the Holy Spirit had convicted the jailer. The, the, the earthquake, the power of the Lord. Listen to the words of the apostle by the Holy Spirit. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Listen, you and your household. You and your family will be saved. Now, you don't get saved for your family. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't say that if I get saved, then automatically all my family is saved. But it does mean that the promise of the gospel and the power of the gospel is strong enough to save not only you, but your entire household. You carry the power of the Spirit of God into your family, and it is the will of God to save families, you and your household. In the mouth of two witnesses, let everything be established. From heaven, the angel said, you and your household. From earth, Paul said, you and your household. To Abraham, he said, you're going to bless families, you and your household. Let me share something else to you, which is really kind of cool. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. Paul had this challenge. What do you do if, if you have two pagans that are married and one pagan comes to Christ and the other one doesn't? What, what do you do with that marriage? Is that an unholy marriage? Is it, un, is it, uh, is it an unclean marriage? Which one's stronger? The paganness of the husband that's lost or the holiness of the wife that's saved? Paul says in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians, he says, For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. The power and the holiness of the wife or the, the spouse that is a believer makes the marriage holy even though you're married to a pagan. That's what Paul says. Now, does it save the person? No, but it makes the union holy. It makes the union holy. So what's stronger, the holiness of God or the paganness of the pagan? The holiness of God. Yea, God. Isn't that hot? But there's more, y'all, because he says, and the unbelieving wife for those is made holy because of her husband. So the pagan wife is made holy by the holy man. Yea, God. So, there's, so if you are married to someone who does not know the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit is on that person, is wooing that person, loving that person, calling that person because God speaks in families and it's for the whole household. But there's more, y'all. Paul then says, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So if, the, if, if only one, if only one is born again, if only one is holy because the Spirit is, is in you, then your children are holy, set apart for the Lord, even though the other spouse is a pagan. Yea, God, the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the kingdom our God is God. The third thing, just quickly. Wait, I'm going to stop right there. I'm sorry. I got instructed to stop right there, so I can stop right there. The instruction is, let's do the word just for a moment. What are you talking about? I just proclaim to you that God speaks and thinks in families that the Lord said that you and your whole household will be saved and that you, if you're born again, you make holy your marriage and you make holy your children. Okay? So I want to take a moment right now in the Lord and I want you, the question is, how big is your household? And can I tell you this? Be it unto you according to your faith. My household is bigger than just the house that I live in. It's my brothers and sisters and their children and their children's children. And it's my cousins. I, I'm, be it unto you according to your faith. I want to spend a minute. Can you take a moment and pray for the kingdom of God to come to your entire household? 
We want to pray for the entire household right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and bring salvation to our entire, entire household right now. Brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews and nieces, in the name of Jesus, uncles and aunts, Lord, spouses, grandparents, Lord, whoever doesn't know you, Lord, I pray, Lord, we are a beachhead. We are a, a, a place where the kingdom is in our life. So now we ask for the promise, you and your household. Lord, save our household. Holy Spirit, I ask for dreams. I ask for visions. I ask for divine opportunities. I ask that for people to witness to my family in Jesus' name. Save our household, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would bring salvation to our entire household. As far as you'll let us believe, God, cousins, Nephews, nieces, in the name of the Lord Jesus, soften their heart, bring them to you. Come, Holy Spirit, right now we ask, save marriages, save children. Holy One, you and your household, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The third thing is, I just want to remind you of the parable that the Lord Jesus spoke about the widow and the judge. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just want to remind you of that parable because it starts this way. And he told them a parable. This is in uh, Luke 18. To the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's Luke. Luke did the commentary before he told the parable. The purpose of this parable is to encourage you to not lose heart, to continue to pray. And you remember the parable was about a widow and an unjust judge. Can I tell you just the cool thing about, many cool things about the Lord? The hero in the story is a woman. The villain in the story is an unjust man. That is that is countercultural, y'all, in this culture. The Lord put the woman on the pedestal as the one who was the example for prayer, and the unjust man is the one that was resisting the will of God. Just say it. But I want you to see that the parable was, we don't know if this widow was a mother, so I'm not going to count her, but I just want you to see the Lord is encouraging us to pray and not to faint, not to just be discouraged not to stop. And for that, we want, to, we want to look at three mothers. Three mothers. And I have to go back because she's my, probably my favorite mother, I guess, other than Mary, the mother of Jesus. But my favorite mother in the scriptures is Hannah. Y'all, we just read Hannah. But I want you to, to continue the story in Hannah, the mother of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1 Listen to this. It's 9 through 18. It's a few verses, but listen to what happened after she made the vow. And as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, remember he's the priest, observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. So she was mumbling. Her mouth mouth was moving, but she wasn't speaking out loud. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord. I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. The old saints used to call that she prayed through. 
She kept praying until she got peace. And she kept praying really until the man of God basically prophesied to her and said, let what you're praying for, let it happen. But what I want you to see is this is a mother who's not a mother yet. She's not a mother yet, and yet she's contending for a child. She's contending for what she does not have, and look what she does. She's troubled in her spirit. Her soul is poured out before God. She, she has great anxiety and vexation. She is yearning for the Lord to break through for her. Can I just tell you now that we see the rest of the story? There's a, there's a concept in the scripture called narrative theology. We talk about that a bit before. There's theology where it says, this is how God works. And it's just, you just say it. God so loved the world. He gave his only son. It just says he loves you and he gave his son. But then there's theology where God teaches us in the story. So look at this story. You have a woman that year after year after year was provoked by the other woman. Year after year she was in shame. Year after year she was beat down. And finally she turns to the Lord and cries out to him and says, I've got to have a son. i got to have a son. I'll give him to you. He'll be dedicated to you. And what happens? She has a son. Then she has a bunch more kids. But she has a son, and that son changes the nation. Could it be that God withholds? Can I even say this? Even allows you to be provoked, to stir you up, to stir you up so that you care enough to come to him with the big prayer, to have the courage to pray the big prayer. Could it be that God actually allows resistance, affliction, hardship, pushback into your face? And some will give up and say, oh, well, whatever. But some will take it by force. Some will say, I'm going to continue to contend until he answers me. Can I tell you, the, the greater the resistance, the greater the son that's born. The greater the resistance is the greater judge, the greater prophet, the greater kingmaker that comes out of that birth. You know, it is prophetic. You know, God does nothing by accident. First the natural, then the spiritual. God ordained that women carry a baby for nine months. God, in, he, he actually is teaching us that the word of God takes time to be born. There's a, there's a delay between the promise and the birth. And thank God, I don't have to do that. The labor thing. Even before the birth, there's this thing called labor thing, right? Labor. He's prophesying to us. The word of God comes and you carry the word and there's resistance. And then there's a birth. And then even when the baby's born, they can't get up and like wash the clothes, right? They're helpless. But that baby grows up to be a kingmaker, a prophet, a judge in Israel. I just want to encourage the moms in the room, do not stop praying. Don't start, stop praying for your children, for your household. Hannah did not stop praying. God answered her prayer. Now, there, there's this concept of, of free will. The Lord's not going to make you believe. So at the end of the day, you can say no. But you... You know, woe the person that says no over the voice of a mom's prayer. Look at Paul. God can do it. Apparently, it's legal to do a lot to convince someone to say yes. Like bright lights, blinding, scare you to their, you know. you. So I think 
look at the book. The book allows the Lord to do a bunch of stuff to convince somebody to, to believe. He, there's free will, but he has his ways. He has his tactics. There's a guy named um, Jonah, and there was a storm, and there was a whale or a big fish. God has his ways. Do not underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit to change and soften a man or woman's heart. Yea, God. But y'all, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage me. I'm, I'm going to sneak in on this Mother's Day message and say the resistance I'm encountering is telling me there's a Samuel coming. There's a Samuel coming, y'all. So you keep praying. You keep mumbling. You keep pouring out your soul. You, you keep being bothered that you don't have a Samuel. We need to be bothered that we don't have a Samuel long enough until Samuel comes. Yea, Hannah, God bless you. Thank you for teaching us. The second woman, y'all, the Gentile woman, the, sometimes she's called the Syrophoenician woman. She's a Gentile. Remember, the, the scripture says, this is in Mark chapter 7. It's actually in two places. I'm going to read it in Mark because Matthew, interesting, Matthew doesn't say anything about how old the kid is, the child is. Mark tells us that it's a little child, a little daughter. It's a child. But listen to this. It says, this is Mark chapter 7. It says, From there he arose, Jesus, and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. All right. So much more we can talk about here, but let me just tell you that it was significant that Jesus left the boundary line of Israel and went to a pagan country. He went to a pagan country because the Scripture says that Israel is the Lord's heritage. It's the Lord's inheritance. But the Scripture seems to indicate, and we'll talk about it another time, you can go and look in Deuteronomy chapter 32, that the rest of the nations were governed by angels, territorial angels that the Lord set up. It was a network of angels. But for Israel, the heritage was the Lord. So when the Lord Jesus walked across the boundary line into pagan territory, he was leaving the territory of Yahweh of the Lord and going into another territory. But what the Lord Jesus was showing is that our God is God over every piece of dirt, over all the land, over all the land. Let me just show you this is a real cool, real cool thing. Remember Naaman the leper? Naaman the leper was a pagan. He came to Elisha. Remember, Elisha said, just dip seven times and you'll be healed. And he was angry at first, but he did. He dipped seven times and was healed. And when Naaman left Elisha, he said, I have one request. And he said, what is it? Let me take with me dirt. Let me take with you dirt with dirt. And so Elisha said, go ahead. So he took two mules of dirt. What was he thinking? Get in his head. I didn't know this. I read it. It's awesome, y'all. What was he thinking in his brain? Here's what he was thinking. I am in the land of Yahweh. I am in the land of the God of Elisha. I'm going back to a pagan land that's governed by a fallen angel. I want to bring holy dirt with me so that I can lay it down on the floor so that I can worship Yahweh on holy land. You see, the, 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 the mindset of that age was that territories were governed by different gods, and our God, Israel, is God, governed by the Yahweh, the Lord. But when you co cross the border, you're in another land serving another God. So it's, it's significant that Jesus, just out of the blue, goes to Tyre and Sidon. He crosses the border. And what does he do there? Listen, a woman comes. The scripture says she heard of him. Listen, Mark. And from these he rose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. And immediately a woman whose little daughter 
had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile, Syrophoenician. Matthew calls her a Canaanite by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. Okay, let me stop here. Jesus just told this Gentile person, she, this Gentile lady is not a part of the covenant of Abraham, right? She's not in the covenant with God. God is a God of covenant. She was not in the covenant. He says, he's, Jesus is saying, the children of the covenant have benefits. You're not in my health care plan. You're out of service because you don't have a plan. You're not in my plan. There's a health care plan for Israel if you're in the covenant. There's a family plan. Y'all, the family plan, Jesus says, includes deliverance from demons. He said, this is the children's bread. This is part of our cafeteria plan. You ever got to work where you have a cafeteria, you can pick dental or eyes or, you know, PPOs, HMOs. You have a health care plan. You get a plan when you come to the Lord. There's a plan when you're in the covenant. And Jesus said, you're not in the plan. You're You're out of service. You're not in the plan. You're not in the covenant. You're not in the family. But if you're in the family, you get deliverance. You just go and get deliverance. You get eyes, you get glasses. Do you get it? If you're in the kingdom, you get this benefit, he says. Y'all, we're in the kingdom. You are in the kingdom. You are in Christ. There are benefits for being in the kingdom. And one of them is this. It's the children's bread. He says, it's not right for me to feed people outside of the plan until everyone else Inside the plan gets service. That's what he's saying. And she says, you know, you're right. What was I thinking? I'm not in the plan. I'm not in the covenant. I'm I'm sorry to bother you. I, you know, I'm sorry. And she leaves, and that's the end of the story. No. She's a mom. She's a mom. And y'all check this out. This is hot. She's a mom of a a baby, a young child. My wife and I have talked about this often. There's there's a spiritual reality that's here. If you are a parent, you have authority over your children, at least until they are old enough. And it's unclear. It may be forever. But there is an authority that a parent has over a child. And get this, the child was not there. I'll show, show you. Look what it says in verse 30. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So she was, get this, she's with Jesus and the child is not there. What does that mean? That means that you can be with Jesus here And your child could be there or at home. It doesn't matter where your child is. The authority of a mom and a dad extend beyond being physically with them. That's hot, y'all. The important thing is for you to be with Jesus. If you're with Jesus, you can touch your child. That's good. That's so good. And so here she is with the Lord. Her child is far away, demonized. She's with the Lord, and she's a mom. And she will not take no for an answer. And you say, God, this is a really rude thing for the Lord to say. It's very rude for him to say. Your dog? Because that's what they call Gentiles. They're Gentiles. The dogs are what lived on the, on the dump on the outside of town. The scraps, they would do the scrap. So the, the Gentiles were people on the outside. They were on the outside. So she wasn't qualified. She didn't measure up. It didn't matter for Jesus. What we learn now, remember, this is this narrative theology idea. After this story, you realize that what Jesus was looking for is, I can help you if you will believe. 
Will you be a mom that will believe? Or will you be a mom that says, you know, know, what was I thinking? You're right. I'm going to go home. Can I get faith from you? Because if you will believe, all things are possible for those who believe, even if you're not in the plan. We have this special, there's a special thing about the plan. If you believe, you get in. If you believe, you get in and you become part of the covenant. Yay, God. And she pressed in, y'all, even though she was unqualified, even though she wasn't in the plan, even though she was in a pagan land and she wasn't standing on holy ground or none of that, she pressed in and got healing for her daughter. Moms, I don't care where your children are, you have authority. Dads, too, you have authority over your kids. You just need to get to Jesus. Jesus can get to the kid. Jesus can get to the daughter or the son. You just need to get to the Lord. And she got to the Lord, and she was tenacious. And you know what? The Lord was not offended. She, at the end, he said, listen to what he said. He goes, and she says, but she answered, yes, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. I don't care what you call me. I, don't care. I know I'm, I'm not. Look, I know I don't deserve it. I know there's no, but even just give me crumbs. All I'm asking for is crumbs, but I'm not leaving until I get crumbs. And he said to her, for this, you may go your way. The demon has left her. Matthew says, the Lord says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Great is your faith. Don't you know the Lord's smiling? Oh, you're. You know, the, the truth is, he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He was only sent to Israel. The reason why he was so abrupt with her is, he says, look, I'm going to come to you. I'm just sending Paul. I'm sending my apostles. It's not that it's not like. You're always going to be dogs. It's just that right now there's a timing thing going on. There's a timing thing, and she she's a mom. She doesn't care about time. I want it now. I need I need to help my daughter now. She was tenacious. She wouldn't give up. Take it. Take it. I don't, you know, the kingdom, there's a scripture that Lori and I have been wrestling with and i'm going to talk about it in a future time but it talks about that that the kingdom is suffering violence jesus said and the violent take it by force and it's a very difficult word to the sentence to interpret in the scriptures because the greek is it's unclear what it means but the more i see this y'all the more i'm convinced that the kingdom of god is not for the passive The kingdom of God is not for the passive. It's not like, yeah, well, if you want to, you know, whatever. Just if you want to, just do it. No, no. It's for the Hannahs that are vexed in their heart or or look like a drunk woman. She's so intense on getting relief from God. This Syrophoenician woman says, you call me a dog? I don't care. I want crumbs. I want my daughter healed. The, 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 The forceful will take from the Lord, not in an arrogant way, but in a, I won't let you go until you bless me way. Jacob wrestled with God himself, and, he, and Jacob was called a prince prevailing. The Lord didn't rebuke him. He said, you're a prince. You have engaged with me. Engage with me. Engage with me, he says. Engage with me, the Gentile woman. Could it be, you know, the scripture says we have not because we asked not. Oh, God, it could be we have not because we didn't want it enough. And, I, you know, I just, I know this, it's dangerous, I know, because it's like, oh, it turns you into, it's not a works thing. No, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about, give me that mountain. I'm talking about changing the region. I'm talking about reaching the nations. I'm talking, you can be saved, but then... I need this crop to grow. I need, to, I need that person to hear you. I, that, for that, we need to engage. We need to be like this mom, this Gentile mother. Engage in the name of Jesus. And then the third mother, y'all. The third mom. The mother of James and John. <clears throat> <clears throat> Is found in Matthew chapter 20. 
It says, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Remember, Zebedee was a wealthy man. He was the dad of James and John. John, the guy who wrote the gospel, the gospel of John, and James. Later, we learn that James was killed by Herod. He was beheaded. So he was, one of the, he was the first apostle to die, James and John. And so the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him, to Jesus, with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. All right, now, I want you to focus with me. Here's a mom. Hannah had no children. She was praying for a child. The Syrophoenician woman, the Syrophoenician woman had a baby girl. But here's a mama with grown kids. Can mamas pray to Jesus about their grown kids? Yes. Mama Zebedee's, Zebedee's wife, what do you know her name? But the mom of James and John kneeled before Jesus and prayed for her adult sons. That's, when you talk to Jesus, that's what we call prayer, right? So she's praying. To Jesus. And he said to her, What do you want? Yea, God. He didn't say, What are you doing here? Uh, kneeling? What's the point? No, he said, I see you've come to ask for something. What do you want, Mama? She said to him, Moms have the courage to pray things that others are afraid to do that. What's the, my sons, what should I ask for them? No, no problem for a mom. Say that these two sons of mine, by the way, he, he, she's got them right there. She has them here. Don't you, you know? Oh, don't you know they're kind of, mom, this is my chance. Obey me. She said, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. How much can we, what are we permitted to pray? I got to hang on right here. I'm going to do a bunny trail, but be with me. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David wanted to build the temple, and the Lord said no. And instead, the prophet came to him and said, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a house. You're going to have a dynasty, David, but your son's going to build the temple. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David comes back and prays to the Lord. And starting in verse 27, 2 Samuel 7, 27, he says this, For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. His prayer was, do what you have said. And he said, I have the courage to pray because you said you would build me a house. She had the courage to ask the king, make my sons sit at your right and left hand. May God give us courage to pray and not to faint. Moms, do not stop praying for your children and pray big. Pray big. Pray big. Go long. In football, you know, when there is a receiver, you can do a short pass or you can go to the end zone. And in the huddle, they just say, the receiver's huddling up and he tells the quarterback, what's the play? And the quarterback just says, go long. What does that mean? Go as far as I can throw it. Go long, moms. Go long, dads. Go long, church. Go long, church. What, oh, God Almighty, wouldn't it be horrible if God answered our prayers, but they were well below what he wanted us to ask? Oh, man. Psalm 2 says, ask of me, 
and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. So she asked for the everything. All right, now this is super hot, y'all. Here's the Lord Jesus. Here's the mom. She's got the two boys. They're adult boys in the presence of Jesus. She asked, she, she comes to, kneels before him, and Jesus speaks to the mom because she's the one praying. And he says, what do you want? And she says, my two boys, let them sit on your right and your left. Okay? That's prayer. She's kneeling. She talk, He talks to her. She talks to him. Then Jesus doesn't talk to her. He now talks to them. Look what he says. Well, maybe the first sentence he's talking to her, but the second sentence he's talking to them. Listen, she, he says, you do not know what you are asking. Then he says, are you, James and John, able to drink the cup that I am to drink? You see that? He answers her, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're asking. But then he says, boys, are you able to drink the cup that I'm drinking? What's the point, preacher? Listen, moms, you can pray your adult kids into an encounter with Jesus. Is that the best? Mom is talking to Jesus. Jesus is talking to mom. And then all of a sudden, everything changes and Jesus is talking to them. That's what happens. You can pray and encounter Jesus. You can bring Jesus to your children. And they said to him, we are able. Let me stop right there because he didn't, he didn't give them the request. He didn't say, okay, done. He, didn't, he actually said no because he says, and I'll tell you in a minute, but what did this accomplish? Can I tell you, I believe this accomplished something in the lives of James and John because they had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus says, can you suffer like I'm going to suffer? And they said, yes, we can. They, there was something happened in their resolve. In their, you, you know, as far as we know, we don't, we don't have any other record except the discussion between the Lord and Peter. We don't have any other record of the disciples having that heart-to-heart commitment with Jesus conversation. Can you suffer like I'm going to suffer? Yes. So what did mom accomplish? She solidified. She, she strengthened. She fortified the relationship of her sons with Jesus as adults. Yay, God. The power the power of a believing mother, the power of a courageous mother, the power of a mother that will not take no for an answer, the power who is willing to ask the big things, the big things from God. Jesus said, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those of whom it has been prepared by my Father. Can I tell you just as a side note, oh God Almighty, think about what the answer the Lord gave, because it's, it's, it's an answer for all of us, y'all. She asked for the highest place, because she wasn't asking to be God, right? She was asking for the highest place that a human being could sit in heaven. And the Lord's response was, that place is for those who are going to suffer like I suffer. Apparently, right? Because his answer was, well, can you go through what I'm going through? And not, again, not to, you don't earn stuff. It's, it's all by grace and gift. But there is, there's this concept of being zealous for him. 
I want to encourage us, even after your kids are grown and they're parents and they have grown kids, doesn't matter how old your kids are, mama and dad too, but something about moms. Mom can bring them into the presence of Jesus and Jesus will encounter them. Yea, God. I want to remind you in James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. And then he says this. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayer of a righteous person, yeah, but you've got to be righteous. But no, no, we're, don't, don't be slowed down by your conduct. The issue is, do you believe in Jesus? Because if you place your faith in Jesus, you have been made right with God, Mom. You are a righteous woman. And the prayers of a righteous woman, a woman of faith, releases great power. Great power. Pray big. Don't pray small. Pray in accordance with the size and the majesty of your God. Two thoughts to to leave with you. In Isaiah chapter 9, that that beautiful passage in Isaiah about his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It says this in Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government, the Messiah, And peace, there'll be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of God, the the jealousy of God, God's passion will make this happen, Isaiah says. The zeal of God will make this happen. And I just want to remind you, there was a, there's a story in the Old Testament. I'm not going to tell the story, but I just want to tell you that Phineas, a grandson of Aaron, saw two people worshiping a false god, and he um, stopped them from doing that. And the Lord says that Phineas had the jealousy of, of God for me. He was jealous for me. He was zealous to protect my honor. He was zealous to protect my glory and who I am. And because of that, to Phineas, the Lord said, I'll make him a perpetual priest. His family will always be priests. The zeal of the Lord, and I just just see the zeal, this zeal of a mother, of Hannah, and of the Gentile woman, and even James and John's mom. The zeal of the Lord that you you basically partner with God in what he wants to do. You partner with him. And then he works through you. He works through you when you pray big. All right, I know I'm not a mom, but I'm going to cheat and jump on that bandwagon. I want to be a courageous prayer. Someone who will pray big prayers, who will, who will ask things that are beyond what I could even think or imagine. And then the book, now unto him who was able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that works within us according to his Holy Spirit within us. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you today. Lord, I honor you today and bless you. Lord, I thank you for your your grace. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen every mother that hears my voice. I pray that you would strengthen every mother's prayer in the house. God, we add to our prayers and we say, do what they're praying, Lord. Answer their prayers. Turn around sons and daughters. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Reveal Jesus to them. 
bring them into their God-given destiny and calling. Hear the prayers of the Hannahs and the Gentile mamas and the mother of Zebedee. Hear those mothers' prayers in this house. And those that are listening, Lord, in the name of Jesus, make it so. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see nothing is impossible to those who believe. Come, Holy Spirit. We bless you, Lord. We honor you today. In Jesus' name, sir, we honor you. Hallelujah.